Hello and welcome to Talk 7 in the Sermon in the Mount Digging Deeper series. We've now finished looking at the background and moving into the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount itself. Having developed his ministry in the culturally mixed Galilee area, the Sermon on the Mount was delivered to two different sets of people. On the one hand, there were those who had a background in Judaism, we'll call them the Jews, and on the other, there were those non-Jews or Gentiles who would have no Tanakh, that's the Jewish Bible or our Old Testament, background at all. Their experience of Jesus to date would have been to witness healings and perhaps hear a few stories. The two groups would have very different background understanding of what was being said. The Jews, as previously mentioned, would have a solid Old Testament knowledge and expectation. The Gentiles almost certainly would not. This talk is looking at the sermon from the perspective of the Jew. Later we will look at the perspective from the Gentiles. There is an awful lot we can learn from the Jewish approach to implement into our daily lives and our church life to enrich both. Let's remember that Jesus is introducing a new covenant, showing the kingdom of heaven and proclaiming himself as Messiah. For centuries, the Jews have been waiting for this moment and they could, as we will see, have expectations and knowledge from the Tanakh that has been promising the Messiah for centuries. Jesus has to introduce that now. Later, they could read the Gospel and would be aided by Matthew's way, as we saw in the first four chapters, of his linking a lot of his message with the prophecies of Isaiah. Equally, the Beatitudes are not understood fully if they are taken as mere statements without recognising that inherent in a blessing, a macarism, is an appeal to live a certain way that will result in a blessedness flourishing offered. Blessed would have an instant impact on the mind of the Jew. The word bless and its derivatives, blessed and blessing, occurs 530 times in the Old Testament, and the majority of times we find it in relation to an action with someone, usually God or his intermediary such as Moses, doing the blessing. The Jews would recognise the first blessing recorded in the Bible is over the creatures and land of the sea. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. Then Adam and Eve were blessed. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them with instruction to multiply. Soon there's the Sabbath day and God blessed this day when he first created it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 3. So we can get some idea as to what a blessing is. Firstly, it's a gift of God, delivered or spoken often by an intermediary, such as a parent or priest. It's something given and received. It has future implications. It has a permanence, although God can and does withdraw it. For example, where Jeremiah was warned not to enter a house of mourning because I have withdrawn my blessing. Jeremiah 16 verse 5 It does not necessarily give you what you want. It can be conditional. If you put your detestable idols out of my sight, then the nation will be blessed. Jeremiah 4, 1 and 2 Blessings can occur anywhere in God's creation. On people, on land, on harvest and so on. It can be with us every step of our journey of life. Today, almost every Jewish prayer begins with the word blessed. The exception is the Shema, 
you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and so on. The Jews recognise that blessing, blessedness, is part of everyday life. For example, as you welcome someone into your home, you say at the door, blessed is the one who comes. So, if Jesus is introducing the kingdom of heaven, then what are the Jews going to take away from the Beatitudes and this blessedness? Firstly, that blessing is ubiquitous, covering every aspect of human life. Here they see it spelled out in detail. That the promised kingdom is one full of blessing, covering every circumstance of life. You can have the kingdom of heaven on earth, those poor in spirit already experience the kingdom of heaven, as do those persecuted because of righteousness. Look carefully at Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 and 10. Thus, there are two kingdoms here that we walk in. And according to John 3, verses 3 to 8, you need to be born into both. They would recognise that many of the qualities Jesus is mentioning are already familiar from the Psalms and Isaiah. The Jews, knowing their scriptures, would be well familiar with most of what Jesus is saying. This would not sound shocking, confrontational or unachievable. The Psalms are full of reference to blessings. Just looking at Psalm 1, we find much that the Jew would recognise later in the Sermon on the Mount. Psalm 1 begins with blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, as do the Beatitudes in the Sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the mourners. The Beatitudes take the same approach, but they are more specific and targeted. Psalm 1 verse 1 is a summary of the eight Beatitudes. Collectively, the Beatitudes show what a person who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly will look like. Still with Psalm 1, we can look beyond the Beatitudes to the rest of the sermon, and the knowing Jew would find, firstly, both invite the hearer on the path of wisdom. Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed if you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Matthew 7 verse 24. The wise man built his house on the rock. Both contrast two paths. Psalm 1 verses 1 and 6. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly. Matthew 7 13 14. Enter the narrow gate. The wide gate leads to destruction. Both use fruit-bearing tree image. Psalm 1, verses 3 and 4. The tree planted by the waters yields fruit in season. Matthew 7, 16 to 20. A good tree bears good fruit. Both speak of final judgment and separation. Psalm 1, 5 and 6. The way of the wicked will perish. Matthew 7, 13, 21 and 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And both contrast those the Lord knows and those he does not. Psalm 1 verse 6. The way of the wicked will perish. Matthew seven twenty three. I will tell them, away from me, you evildoers. For the Jew... It is the assembly of the Beatitudes by Jesus, forming a mosaic of believer character, people in all different situations and walks of life, that is the unique bit. Most definitely, we have a picture of the kingdom of heaven. Other Psalms would also be recognised. There are over 20 with blessed in them. For example, Psalm 2, verse 12. Blessed are all those who put their trust in the Son. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Or Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed is he who considers the poor, 
the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. And we could go on. Jesus would certainly be getting them thinking. Thinking, who is this man? And from where does he get his knowledge? But let's not forget the Isaiah link. Matthew constantly refers to Isaiah in his Gospel as the first four chapters have already shown us. The Beatitudes could well have set the minds of Jewish listeners and their readers, if not the listeners, back to Isaiah 60 and 61, which I haven't time to read in this talk, but I would recommend that you have a look at them in relation to the Beatitudes. Beatitudes are macarisms, which are invitations to a way of living based on discernment, reflection and, of course, faith. These two chapters of Isaiah's prophecy form the basis of the Beatitude. For example, in Isaiah 61 verse 1, he says, The Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here is the good news for the poor, which they can discern and then ponder upon before making a decision as to whether this man, Jesus, is the Messiah that the prophets foretold. Here in the kingdom of heaven, opening up to them before their very ears and eyes. The way for this thinking was opened by John the Baptist with his direct reference to Jesus, recorded in Matthew 3, verse 3. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, with such as Isaiah 60, verse 1 in mind. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. It is not only through Isaiah that these visionary pictures would be formed. Matthew also considered the Psalms to be prophetic and show eschatological emphasis as he explains in Matthew 13, 35, quoting Psalm 72, verse 8, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So, in Psalm 37, verse 11, we read, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. While in Matthew 5, 5, the third beatitude reads, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Equally, the Jew, where perhaps not so the Gentile, would have a historic understanding of the type of person referred to in the beatitude. Those who mourn are not necessarily, but could be, those mourning a loved one, but the Jew who is mourning his relationship with God. Psalm 43 verse 2 gives a clue. You are a God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? I said that I was not going to read Isaiah 61, but how could any Jew listening to the Beatitudes, not recognise Isaiah's prophecy in 61 verses 1 and 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to pro proclaim freedom for the captive and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. But to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Clearly then. The Jew who had any knowledge of the Tanakh, and that would be most of them, especially the scribes, Sadducees and Pharisees, would be well aware as to what was going on. It is difficult to see how these people 
could be so against what Jesus was saying as to crucify him. What did they understand? And what picture of a saviour messiah did they have? Story will be rather different for the Gentiles.